Some say the issue of sex for grades is so normalized that students are warned of alleged predators even before they begin their classes. But many women are speaking out, and we'll hear from some of them in the next half hour, as well as from observers who say ending sex for grades is a multifaceted issue, and its eradication requires schools, governments, and students to work together. Hello there, and welcome to The Conversation. I'm Ayan Bior with my colleagues, Haiti Adams Fitzpatrick, and Ariane Itangi Shaka. To help us advance this conversation is Tatu Sophie Katasi, a former media personality and student at Uganda's Makerere University. And joining us from Ghana is Fred Awa, a lecturer at the University of Professional Studies, Accra. Thank you, everyone, for joining us. Thank okay. you for having me, ladies. Yes, thank you. Welcome. Sexual harassment and misconduct towards students by lecturers at the University of Ghana have had an international spotlight on them recently due to an undercover BBC investigation, which advocates say is now inspiring real change. VOA Stacey Nod reports from Accra. The University of Ghana is looking into the allegations against staff in the BBC investigation, which found teachers harassing women they thought were taking their classes. The Sex for Grades documentary focused on the University of Lagos in Nigeria and the University of Ghana in Accra. At both schools, it showed university lecturers propositioning female reporters who were posing as students. Ghanaian activist Eugenia Bafour contributed research to the investigation. She says the fallout is helping more victims to speak out. Something good is, has already come out, even for the number of stories that came out, the, the kind of um, courage and strength they gave a lot of um, victims and survivors to speak out about their, um, about their abusers was a huge step for us in the right direction when it comes to um, you know, not being silenced anymore as a, as a victim. As first reported by the BBC, there are increasing allegations of sexual harassment by teachers at West African universities. The University of Ghana's Anti-Sexual Harassment Committee is investigating two of the accused. The committee head says they are intensifying their outreach, but needs student victims to come forward. All we ask of them is that don't endure any humiliation, don't endure any harassment. Let us take that responsibility. And once you inform us, you are virtually saying, I'm offloading this burden on you, take it up. And we shall do that. But if you don't tell us, and you keep it to yourself. You are emboldening the, the perpetrator. The University Student Representative Council Women's Commissioner says that while the allegations of sex for grades are disturbing, they are not new. She hopes the scandal will bring awareness to students who were not familiar with the university's policy, that they can and should report harassment. Over the year, there hasn't been the enabling environment for victims to approach the SRC and um, address or um, inform them about these malpractices or these um, mishappenings that are going on. The Student Council is launching a campaign to support victims of sexual harassment and also one to educate teachers about inappropriate behaviour with students. Stacey Knott for VOA News, Accra. You know, this documentary has really shone a light on something that we all know and we all know on the continent yeah. has mm -hmm. been going on for a very long time. Yes. Tatu, you have your own story yeah. about this. How widespread mm -hmm. is this problem? I mean, this, this documentary featured two universities in yes. West Africa. Yes. But it's not just happening there. That's true. Absolutely true. While I don't have statistics to share with you, I'll just let you know my first experience with this. Um, I think it was my first week in university at Makere University. I was living in a hostel and while waiting for the shuttle to take us to hostel, there were some students who were years above me mm. and they asked me, oh, you're an evening student? I said, yes. Are you new? They call them freshers. Yeah. Are you a fresher? I said, yes, I am. They said, you know what? Um, just a heads up. In the event that after your lecture, the lecturer asks you to follow him to his office, ask to meet him the following day, during the daytime. Mm. I'm like, uh, that's strange. Right. They're like, oh, no, 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 because they do that. And when you get there, it has nothing to do with the class. Wow. It has nothing to do with, you know, the lecture. Sort of informal you're doing. orientation. Exactly. Right? So I got that orientation 
from students. Wow. Even before you started class? Even before my first class. At least you did. At yeah, least I did. But you right. see, this is them anticipating it. Right. Either Absolutely. because they've yeah. experienced yeah. it or because they know, you know what, mm, it'll right. only be a matter of time before it comes to you. Right. So just a heads up. Mm. And Mr. Fred, I want to bring you into this conversation because when we were talking last week, you talked about the impact um, that sex for grade scandals have on a school's reputation, um, as well as the degrees and the rankings. Um, so we just heard Tatu talk about some of the consequences. I'm wondering if you could wage in as well. Now, the reality is that the issue of sex for grades uh, undermines the quality of training in African universities. And as I said to you the other time, the reality is that it reduces the credibility and then it's standing in the international community, especially when it comes to uh, university ranking. One of the key issues that goes into ranking universities across the world is the issue of reputation of the university and quality of training. If the sexual rights of a lady is compromised for the purpose of giving her grade, now the quality of her own training, that is the skill, knowledge, and attitude needed for that lady to impact community and then other stakeholders minimizes. So this reflects one in the labor market and also reflects in areas of uh, higher education where she gets to places where other university graduates come from, other institutions where they genuinely had their grades. Now, if it is not with the consent of the student that you compromise her, her sex, you compromise her sexually, the issue of her confidence declines, the trauma that is related with it also comes up very strongly. And then, of course, we know that it takes years for her to uh, to sometimes recover. Recover, and I do agree with uh, Fred that you know the ranking of the universities is at stake. Uh, mm -hmm. but what I'm realizing from what I've gathered, uh, a number of universities on a continent do have. Uh, laws um, in their yeah. in their university languages of yeah. sexual harassment. I mean, you know, South mm -hmm. Africa, Uganda, Nigeria, mm -hmm. even Ghana and, uh, and Nigeria and Cameroon. Yes. A lot of the major universities do have laws, mm -hmm. and the universities, from what I've gathered, that don't have yeah. the uh, sexual harassment languages, they mm -hmm. depend on the pinnacles of the country. Yes. But what I really think it's not really the issue of sex for grades. To be mm -hmm. honest with you, I think it's an issue of lawlessness and yeah. impunity. Yeah, lawlessness because of perverted teachers that want to use their authority over their students yes. right. but also we it's not just them it's also yeah. the students uh, yeah. who are unachieved and wants mm -hmm. to use sex to get the grades to that they, the need. Grades they mm -hmm. need and yeah. impunity of course because um, many teachers get away with it and yes. victims are tired of it yes. and right. also the students yeah. who I believe a lot of times we don't hear about them being uh, you know criminalized for mm -hmm. their uh, you know sexual uh, you know behaviors at yes. uh, the university that are, yeah. are inappropriate um, you know when you speak about the laws being present having the laws is one thing the students knowing that there are laws against it is another thing right. we talked about my orientation that I got from students you right. know I don't know what the university has to say about you know if you're sexually harassed, what do you do? Right. Or what constitutes of sexual and harassment? Also, it's about behavior because we. Yeah. this is not about whether the men are wrong or the women are wrong. Yes. It's about the behavior itself that should be outlawed. The behavior yeah. itself is shameful no matter who yes. engages in it. Yes. Mm -hmm. Right. I mean, the, the burden of the shame should be on the perpetrators, not yeah. on the victims, right? right? But yeah. Ariane, I, I do agree with you that lawlessness and mm -hmm. impunity are contributing factors, mm -hmm. but there's also the issue of the silence, mm -hmm. um, the, the silencing of the victims and the culture of silence around these issues and you know you have to think this issue right now is in the spotlight there's a lot yeah. of people talking about it but what happens weeks or months from now when the news is not aggressively pursuing this story right. mm -hmm. what happens because the at the end of the day we do I, live in societies I, that I believe and institutions we go to um, learning institutions yes. um, workplace environments mm -hmm. that are not really set up for the safety and and the advancement of women yes. um, much more for the abuser um, yeah. than for anyone who is victimized by it and I I also want to throw the question to Mr. Fred about the, what he spoke about, which is very critical, the reputations of these African universities. Do you think that um, the teachers are getting the feel that they're being attacked as African teachers, professors? Well, I think that there is no sense of attack on African professors because every university, at least those that I know, have codes of conduct, including my own university, which clearly stipulates that the lecturer should not have sensual relationship with a student. For as long as the student is within the confines of the university, within her period of what? Study. So lecturers are aware of this. So I give you examples. Uh, university of Limpopo, uh, the Botswana Accountancy College, and my own university, University of Professional Studies. All of these universities are aforementioned. 
have had lecturers who have been disciplined as a result of media reports that they have taken advantage of uh, female students for the purposes of enhancing their grades. When actions were taken, none of them, none, 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 not, not even in one of the single universities did the lecturers fight back because they knew ahead of time that their actions or inactions regarding um, going contrary to the sexual conduct law in the university had repercussions on them. So university lecturers do not in any way feel that uh, they are being attacked. They only have come to the realization that the reality of sex for grades is now dawning on university or academics. So there is the need to sit up and do that which is right and consistent with the laws of the universities. You know, we are, we are talking right now about this issue in academia, but we all know it goes well beyond academia. Exactly. Here at the VOA, we just did a story about sex for fish in Malawi. Mm -hmm. And so, you know, what's really worrying for me is the yeah. cycle. Yeah. It begins early on in your life, sex yep. for grades, that becomes yeah. sex for jobs, it becomes yeah. sex for food, sex yeah. for rent, sex for a promotion. Yeah. Where does it end? I mean, is that's probably the scariest thing about this yes. for women. But, but, but also, right. but what are the risks and what are some of the rewards of speaking out? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. I think currently um, we have very many people looking at this. Last year, NBS in Uganda did a story uh, on a certain lecturer from the College of Social Works, I think. And after that, well, we do know he was dismissed. But that's it. Has he started working mm -hmm. in a different university? Because, you know, yes, you get the shame in that moment right. as the abuser. But does your life go on afterwards? Right. You know, it's like healthcare, a healthcare. when the spotlight yes. is gone. Yes. Yeah. In can healthcare continue. here in this country, what I right. know for a fact is there are certain things you'll do and your license will be taken away from right. you. You'll never practice ever again. again. These yes. lecturers, they're back in universities. Mm. And guess what? Are they stopping what they were doing previously? Yeah, so probably absolutely not. Probably not. You know? uh, Mr. Fred, I want to bring you into this conversation because you've researched this issue for a very long time. What are some of the risks and what are some of the rewards um, for victims when they do decide to speak out? Well, one of the key issues uh, that, is, uh, that has been exposed in literature as a risk is the issue of victimization. And students themselves would always say that they do not want to report because they they fear that if they report, there are tendencies that the institutions may not take very hard actions against the lecturers, and there are tendencies that they will also fail in their examinations. So that is one of the key risk factors associated with making known the issues of sex for grades or any sexually related harassment within a, the confines of a university campus. There is also the issue of security of uh, the victim or the lady. There are tendencies that uh, she would think she would be hurt by the lecturer or other persons associated with uh, the lecturer if uh, she does report. So they are the key risk figures, apart from the issues of her reputation that uh, she may want to protect. However, the high, high, the high sides are, are more advantageous to not only the lady, but the entire higher education arena. One. When you do report issues of sex for uh, sex for marks or sexual harassment, one you are helping other or you are emboldening other female students to speak out about the issue, and that enhances academic quality within the university enclave. It is also important to understand that if female students speak, it improves the credibility of the university. One, it also improves the quality of teaching and learning within the academic environment because lecturers get to understand that the basis of getting sex from a student using harassment is not right. And if you do, female students are emboldened to report you. So they, 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 they emphasize, they, they think more of teaching rather than doing things contrary to the issues that would bring them into shame. That's a very good point. Thank you so much. Unfortunately, we have to cut this conversation short, um, and there's still a lot more to talk about, but we have to wrap up this conversation. Thanks again to Fred Awa, lecturer at the University of Professional Studies, Accra, and former Macquarie University student, Tatu Sophie Katasi. Thank you both for joining us today. Thank you. Thank well, you. here's a story about a young woman who stood up and spoke out.
A decade ago, Selma Bello was a student at Nigeria's Kaduna State University, where she says one of her professors demanded sex from her in exchange for good grades. Well, Bello says years after she left university, she was haunted by what happened. Even worse was seeing that professor not held accountable. So Bello staged a one-woman protest right in front of her alma mater. She also took to social media to bring attention to her case. Did it work? Well, at the time of this show's taping, Kaduna State University had not responded to our request for comment, but media reports suggest the university did launch an investigation into the matter and suspended that professor following Bello's protest. Bello says it's never too late to speak out. The reason why I protested against my university and Kaduna State University is this. I realize if you want justice, you have to stand up and get it yourself. Nigeria is not a country that just hand over justice to you. And if I try to reach out to any of the institutions, the best possible thing they would have done is try to bury the issue. They wouldn't want the media or the public to know about it. After the protest, I got a lot of hate, both negative and positive comments. I have young girls sending me messages telling me they are also victims, but they can't come out and talk because of the stigma. And I have others saying I was hired to ruin him. But it's usually easy to judge when you're not a victim. The institution promised to do something about it, which they actually did. They suspended him, hired a committee to launch a fresh investigation against him, alongside other lecturers that were involved. And also, we have to encourage young girls to speak out. We have to encourage students. We have to let them know their rights. And we have to stop recycling sexual predators from one institution to another, because that's what we do. We give them recommendations from one institution to another, and the moment they get there, they pick up the old habit of trading sex for grade. Please, we have to stop doing this. Being part of Our Voices is about more than just sitting here and talking about women's issues, it's about listening to them. And bringing their opinions to the table and making sure their voices are heard. Because our lived experiences, our stories and our voices will help shape the next generation. You're with our voices. Welcome back. Today we're talking about the consequences of sex for grades. And we want to hear from you. Does this happen in your country, in your university? And what can be done to protect students? Let us know on Facebook, Twitter, and Instagram. Our handle is at VOA, our voices, and our WhatsApp number is on your screen. Now, there are resources and options for victims and governments are writing laws to protect students. And that is our focus today. Joining us in this conversation is Oluwashian Ayodeji Asawobi the executive director of the Stand to End Rape Initiative. Thanks for being here. Thank you for having me. And, you know, ladies, this issue isn't just happening in schools. It's mm -hmm. happening, for example, in places of work as well. Well, it, this is the most worrying part for me about it. We have laws and we have documentaries out, and that's, those are all very important elements. I worry about when everything goes quiet and the cycle continues beyond the walls of academia. And um, Olu Washian, you can um, tell us a little bit about this too. What do you, in your view, should be the message for men and what should be the message for women because um, sex for grades becomes sex for a job, becomes sex for fish, becomes sex for rent, sex for food, and it just continues through the cycle throughout women's life. What's the messaging here to make the stop? So basically, um, what we are trying to tell people, especially men, is that, you know, we see you um, for over decades now, sexual harassment within universities and within the workplace has become a norm. And, you know, step by step, we're trying to, you know, um, read our educational system of this um, abuse. And so the message for men is you might have been doing it for a long time, but we are actually watching. But the idea is to empower women, to help women understand that this sort of uh, violence is not normal that you're not able to identify what it is that's making you normal. And this are the signs of sexual harassment. And now you can speak to NGOs like Family and its initiative where we can provide you with support. And that's why we're very happy to collaborate with the BBC for the undercover investigation, which you all know as Sex for Grades, um, where we went to two universities, one of the one in the University of Lagos, where we got um, evidence against um, one of the key players in, in the documentary, um, when, um, Dr. Benitez who has not been suspended by the university. So what we're trying to show is a pattern that, you know, um, it was back in the day that you sued, harassed the students and nothing happened. In this present age, 
are angry and about this violence, we will take action against you. And that's the message we're sending to men. And we're reminding women that they can speak up, they can get help when they choose to. Yes. And Ms. Oshawabi, we know that many co uh, communities on the continent are still very patriarchal societies, very patriarchal environments. Uh, do you think that, um, is it possible that the reason why sexual harassment in institutions such as university um, happens more often to women, of course, as many research have shown, because the university environment, it's still very much male-dominated? Yes, I absolutely agree. Um, in a particular university where I met a single professor, she did share her experience with me regarding having gone through sexual harassment during her own time because her supervisor refused um, to pass her through, except she had sex with him. Um, so when she became a professor, she started creating a, a network, a safety network for every other female lecturer to ensure that no other male lecturer sort of you know, violates their rights or demands for sex. So very evident, if we have more women like this professor in power, things will change. And the reason we have sexual harassment very deeply rooted in our universities is because we have more male lecturers. We have men at the end of the affairs. And who, who, I mean, when we have the, the number of students who want to attend the university, majority is always female. And so you have females, you know, interfacing with these lecturers, either for admission purposes or to register for accommodation or to register their courses. And throughout all these processes, you have men who are abusing their power in public offices to demand for sex in exchange for whatever it is that the female students need. So evidently, we're operating in a patriarchal system where men are abusing their powers, and because it's like a cabal. So these lecturers know each other and they protect each other. And the policies in schools are not really expected to protect the students. So that's why we have a lot of harassment cases ongoing in universities. I'm very curious to hear what really um, encourages and emboldens women to come forward and speak about this. Earlier we talked about the risks and rewards. Um, we also have featured a woman earlier whose friends warned her against talk, speaking out about this because they told her there'd be a backlash. What emboldens women and what does the backlash actually look like? So what embodies women, um, I would say, in three um, different steps. So first is education. So education in terms of what sexual harassment really is, because I've met students who don't even understand that when a lecturer leaves an unwelcome comment or touches them in a certain way to sexual harassment. So we need to enlighten and help women learn the very, um, you know, bad attitudes of lecturers that they've come to get very comfortable with. That will embolden them to speak up more. Secondly, we need to have policies. If you look at the Nigerian educational system, we have the association or um, called ASU that oversees um, the academic staff union of, of the university. This body ought to have like a regulatory policy that helps to keep its members who are lecturers in check. But unfortunately, we don't have this policy it's very effective, and you can tell from the human you know, like for example. So we need we actually need policies to help protect students who come forward to report cases because without these policies, women will not want to come forward. Then the third thing is a system. If you don't have a system in place to protect and to, to provide support to survivors, then we can't embody them to speak up because no student wants to fail an exam or be targeted by other lecturers because she spoke up. So we need to have these three things in place to help more women speak up, understand their rights, and you know, possibly we can read uh, our educational system of this abuse. And Oluwashi, and some of those systems could be the legal system itself. And I know that yeah. you are helping to work on a bill, a bill called the Sexual Harassment and Tertiary Institutions Bill. Could you talk a little bit more about that? Um, so this bill was introduced in the year 2016 by um, a senator in the Nigerian Assembly who is now the Deputy Speaker of our National Assembly. And so what we did was um, to speak to the then Speaker of the House to say, there are a couple of loopholes in this bill. It doesn't really protect students that we expect it to or would you know, intend for it to. And so we've been engaging an advocacy for the past three years, demanding for this policy to be reviewed and to be passed into law. Because what this policy simply wants to do is to help establish cases of sexual harassment, help it, um, constitute 
who should be part of the panel to investigate such a case, and the number of years you know, a lecturer would be um, uh, entitled to in terms of jail term. So this is the policy we've been working on for the past three years in collaboration with other civil society organizations. And up to date, it hasn't been passed. It's been passed by the Senate, but not by the House of Representatives. And after the text of the great documentary was released or published, we saw the Senate saying, oh, can we quickly pass this bill and make it go, you know, let, let's, you know, do like a, an action to show that we are, we are interested in the issue. But the concern here is not about past bill. It's about how effective the bill will be when it's passed. So we're currently working with um, three SOs in Nigeria to see how the current bill we have will be strengthened to be passed and implemented when um, it is passed into law. Because the Association of Staff Union is actually rejecting the bill because they say it threatens the autonomy. But we know that the autonomy currently promotes and protects abusers within the institutional system. So this bill would help us um, eradicate that. That was Olawashian Ayodeji Asawobi, the executive director of Stand to End Rape Initiative, joining us from Lagos. Well, professors targeting students is a global issue, but there are women fighting against this system. After the break, we introduce you to a student-led movement in Addis Ababa aimed at protecting female students. We'll be back in a moment. Welcome back. It's time for our Women to Watch segment, but this week we are watching a movement instead of a woman. This yellow movement began in 2011 in Addis Ababa University after a group of law students and a lecturer saw a need to create a platform where students can safely discuss gender-based violence. Since it began, the movement has worked to raise awareness for better treatment of women in Ethiopia's patriarchal society. They do this by holding speaking engagements and publicly and privately encouraging students to call out sexism and discrimination. This initiative is the first of its kind in the country and has over 35 members from both genders. And we leave you with a quote from Monica Osagi, a survivor and former student at Nigeria's Obafemi Awolowo University. She used her voice to say, for me, speaking up will bring more women to speak and eradicate what is happening around young women and older men. There is no work or education that is worth your dignity. And that's our show for today. Thanks for Olawashian Ayodeji Asawobi, Fred Awa and Tatu Sophie Katasi for joining us today. On behalf of The Voice of America and along with my colleagues, good day.